Thank you. So, uh, so as stated, my talk will be about finite state machines in Python and how to love the automaton, or if you've never seen that word, you think I misspelled automation. Uh, <laughs> the first time I read this slide, I, I misread it too. Uh, so I'm Brian, I'm a software engineer at Telnex. Perhaps you've heard of us by now, hopefully, maybe. Yeah, you stopped by our table. We won't tell your employer. Um, been in the industry about 13 years. The vast majority of my experience is in Python. A couple of years ago, my local market back in Philadelphia kind of switched by and large over to Python, so I kind of drank the Kool-Aid and so I, you know, moved over. Um, most of my time has been spent doing things like distributed systems and big data. Uh, most of what I've been doing in Python is stuff working with, uh, with Spark, and more recently I do a lot of distributed system work within Telnex. Oh, did we die again? <laughs> Should I try turning it off and on again? <laughs> so, uh, so a little bit about my employer. As I said, I work for Telnex. We are a telecom in the U.S. that has operations worldwide. Uh, we have an office here in Dublin, which is why they we're out here speaking. Um, part of this presentation is I'll be doing a demo of one of the systems we have called Call Control. So I'll show you how you can write an API using finite state machines to control a telephone call. Try not to shake the podium. So, what are finite state machines? Uh, it's a mathematical form of computation. If those of you who graduated uni recently, you know, didn't drink too hard, maybe you can remember the nights you stayed up crying working on these assignments. I know I certainly spent a few nights crying, you know, preparing for this. Uh, but the whole idea is that you have some form of automation where at any given time your system is in some given state. And this is kind of natural. You put it in an order, you're waiting for the payment to go through payment goes through, you're waiting for shipping. We kind of deal with finite state machines all the time, uh, even though we don't necessarily think of them as finite state machines. But the whole idea is that the system's always in one state, and given some state, there are only so many other states you can transition to, right? So you can kind of think of this as a graph of states. A uh, super, super easy example is a, is a turnstile. If I go into a subway back home, the turnstile is locked, but if I put in a coin, it goes into the unlocked state. If I walk through it, it goes back to the locked state. If I put in a second coin like an idiot, it still stays unlocked. It doesn't penalize me for putting in a second coin. That'd be weird. Um, but super, super, super simple example of a finite state machine. So why do I care about these? What do I want to use these for? Well, the short answer is automating things, which is kind of a silly answer seeing as how the purpose of writing any sort of code is to automate stuff. But the longer answer is that by modeling your problems as a finite state machine, at least in, in some cases for us, we're able to decompose our problem into a bunch of smaller bite-sized chunks. Uh, so instead of having a bunch of spaghetti code with a thousand if statements littered throughout or uh, you know, loops that are impossible to decipher, I can express something as a graph of, of states and places those states can go and it becomes much more predictable. I can work on part of the machine without necessarily having to understand the rest of it or without having to, to really hurt my head. Uh, so an example at Telnex, uh, you know, sometimes the phone numbers that people buy don't come from us. Sometimes we have to turn around and partner with another carrier. Uh, as you can guess, you know, the, the process of purchasing a telephone number can get really complex. Sometimes we have to go to some other carrier and say, hey, is this number still available? And they can, may come back and say, sure. Or they may come back and say, we're busy, piss off. Um, and then you know, once they say the number's available, we have to say, okay, we'd, we'd like to buy that number. And once we buy that number, we have to let a bunch of other telecoms know that we now own this number. And then we have to test it, and then we give it to a user. And each one of these cases could have several edge cases. Sometimes they fail, sometimes we need to retry. Um, sometimes we get completely unexpected responses from our, from our you know, downstream partners. Um, so modeling this type of process as a finite state machine allows us to focus on each chunk separately and allows us to be very, very careful in how we handle our edge cases. We don't want to have to call IT every time a phone number purchase fails, that would be terrible. Great, through the slide deck. So the vast majority of this presentation, I want to spend uh, taking a look at how I implemented a finite state machine. So I spent you know, all of a whopping 30 seconds describing what one is, but I didn't really tell you anything about how to express one or uh, what's available for expressing them in Python. And that's what we're here to talk about, right? How to, how to express stuff in Python. So a bit of a code sample. Um, 
I used the Django cookie cutter, thank you PyDanny, to come up with a quick Django project. And in this Django project, I have three different entities. I have uh, a model, I have some controller, and I have some FSM. So let's go through and take a look at those things. Uh, so the idea with call control, uh, the product I'll be demoing, is that if someone tries to call me, I'll receive a webhook. Uh, Telnix will call into my system saying, hey, someone's trying to call you. And, uh, and then they'll go away. And if I wish, I can issue them a command. I can give them some sort of post saying, hey, can you, can you answer that call? Or, hey, can you hang up on them or play them some sound, start recording them, any, any number of things. So the idea is that every time someone calls into me, I want to record the fact that someone called into me, this is my state, that I'm going to feed my finite state machine. And the way I'm going to persist that in between calls from Telnex's webhook is in the database. So I have two models which are identical in everything except for name. I have my current, call, I have my current state, and I have my list of previous states. So the idea is every time someone calls in, I want to assign some sort of state label. I don't want to have to necessarily read all the fields to figure out that this is a new call or to figure out that I've seen this person before. Rather, I want to be able to quickly go to some label. I want to be able to quickly determine that this is one of those states that I've predefined. Um, I want to know who I'm talking about, the phone number, when did I last see them, uh, their last call session, because perhaps I've seen this phone number before, but they since hung up and called back, so they've initiated a new call session. Um, I want to know how many times they called me before. Are they, are they bothersome? Are they a pain in my butt? Uh, and I keep a couple things for tracing purposes. I, I record the last event that Telnex sent me, and if I made a call back to Telnex, I record the response uh, that their API gave me when I issued a command. Uh, the reason I've separated these things into separate models is that uh, if someone calls me, I want to be able to very quickly find out the last state they were in. So uh, you can think of this if you ever dealt with event sourcing before, the call control state machine contains all of the events that have ever happened. And the current call control state machine contains only the last thing that happened. So the idea is that it's, it's much quicker to query the first table than it is the second table. But should I need to go back and look at history and figure out what happened, uh, figure out what this number has been through, I can go back to that table and say, show me all events that ever happened to some given phone number, sort by ID since it's monotonically increasing, and that will show me every event that it's been through and the data that were attached to those events. So, so happy days, that's easy peasy. The next thing is the, should probably exit all the way out of presentation mode. So the next thing is the view. So, so how does uh, this web call interact with this model and this finite state machine? So the idea is, and I, I know I could have used uh, the Django REST framework, but the goal here was to try to keep all the code in one place for presentation purposes, so I'm aware that there are definitely some things I could have cleaned up. But for the sake of simplicity, I, uh, whenever I receive a post request from Telnex, in other words, when I receive one of their webhooks, I make sure that the message looks sane, make sure it's JSON you know, unserializable, and then I try to find my last state out of the database. I call it by, uh, by call session ID. Now, just because I don't find anything does not mean I haven't seen this caller before. Perhaps I've seen this caller at the same phone number and they've initiated a new session. So at that point, I execute a second query. Have I, have I seen this phone number before? And if I have, then I go ahead and load that state. If I have not, then I say, okay, you're a brand new, you're a brand new person. I'm going to instantiate a finite state machine at the very, very beginning and from there, the rest of the process is the same. So once I have this state, which I unoriginally call FSM state, I instantiate some machine, which is yet to be seen. I pass in the state that I pulled out of the database, so what I knew about them before, uh, the event that I received about them, and I pass in some, um, some HTTP client that allows the finite state machine to make calls back to Telnex. And then I, uh, there are times where I have to give Telnex URLs to other places in my service, uh, and because I'm not passing in a request object, I have to somehow tell the FSM what my base URL is, right? So if I'm telling Telnex I want it to play a sound, what I'm actually doing is giving it a URL, so I, I need a way to form URLs to tell Telnex to go grab an MP3 file. Machine.next is really where all the magic happens. That's where the FSM call, uh, where the control transfers to the FSM, the FSM decides what state it's in, how to transition, what actions to take. Uh, 
And then after that, I'm just doing housekeeping. I'm taking that FSM state, updating when I last saw it, updating that last call session ID. Uh, this little bit down here is writing to the ledger. Uh, a little bit of metaprogramming to copy fields out of one model type into the other, and I'm done. So, so really the purpose of the controller here is simply to retrieve previous state, start a finite state machine, defer control to it, and then save whatever comes out of it, and, and move on. So, so on to the interesting part. Awkward pause. The finite state machine itself. So to do this, I used a library called Transitions. Uh, earlier I made the, the claim that you can kind of think as a finite state machine as a, as a graph of states, right? You can move from node A to node B, and then node B is only connected to so many other nodes, so you have a limited option of directions you can move. Um, so you can kind of think, you could, you could you know, possibly conceive of expressing a finite state machine as some sort of adjacency list, right? Uh, state A could go to state B, state A could also go to state C. State, D, state, state B could transition to D and maybe nowhere else. Maybe D is a terminal state, so you never see it in the left-hand column. So you can kind of imagine that maybe writing a finite state machine from scratch would be a little bit silly because you could have some reusable machinery. So the whole purpose of Pi transitions is to give you some reusable machinery. Uh, so here I used a subclass called hierarchical machine. I'll get into the definition of that in a second. Um, but up front, I, I express every state as I, there we go, I didn't break anything. I express every state that exists in the system. Uh, so I have the, the notion of a new user, and then it has child states, new user null, new user initiated, new user answered, playback started, ended, so on and so forth. Right, so, so in this system, I have a collection of a mm, little over a dozen, dozen and a half states. So I'm staying up front that these states exist. These are the only states that could ever exist. If I ever pass in anything to my finite state machine that is not one of these states, it will puke because it's not valid. Uh, likewise, I'm guaranteed that we'll never spit out anything other than these. So if you go back to this graph example, here I've defined what nodes exist, but I've not defined how they're connected or, or the directions in which they can move. So that's where the transitions come in. So if I say, hey, I, I'm in state A, I want to go to state B, the way you would say that is I want to transition to state B. So here I define the list of transitions that exist. Now this particular system happens to have a lot of transitions because I had to make it robust in case people call my number and decide to, uh, to test me. Uh, so I'll, I'll focus in on a couple cases. Uh, the idea is that when you, when you want to transition, uh, in, in Pi transitions you would say you have a trigger and each trigger has a name. And in the background, Pi transitions ties that into a method. You'll see that all these triggers happen to be named next. The reason I did that is because in my view, that hotkey doesn't work. Somewhere there was a place where I called machine.next, right? So that's telling my finite state machine I wish to call the next trigger. Um, I could have named these things different things, but I opted not to. Uh, you, could, you could do one of two things. Either you can examine your event and say, oh, based on this event, I'm going to call this trigger, which means you really have to have some sort of lookup table in your, in your controller. Or, if they all share the same name, this now acts like a routing table. Pi transitions will go down the list until it finds the first thing that works, and it will execute it. And if none of these work, Pi transitions can either throw an exception for me, or can no op. And in the case of this machine, I know op, because I know there are events the user could send to me that are completely legitimate events, that I just don't care about. Um, so everything in this example shares the same name. I have the, na the source of, the, uh, of the, the state and the destination which I wish to transit to. And then I have some conditions. So here, if I call next and I'm in the new user state, I could transition to the new user initiated if what I detected was an incoming call event. So in Pi transitions, this is called a conditional transition. Uh, all these transitions share the same name. How does it know which one to choose? It goes down the list in the order I've defined it and chooses the first one where the conditions match. Um, likewise, I could also have, uh, I could also be in the new user initiated state and then call control calls me up and says that, uh, that the call's been answered. So what I really wanna do now is transition to the new user answered. Uh, in this particular system in call control, it's completely possible that I get duplicate events or they get events out of order. 
So I have to be very careful here because the upstream service does not provide these guarantees to me, so I now have to provide them, which is okay because uh, setting up the finance state sheet machine like this guarantees that I'll always transition forward, but never backward. So never will I ever, uh, for instance, get a message that says that the user hung up, and then if I get an out of order message saying a user called me, well, I've, there is no valid transition to go from hung up to receiving a call for that same call session ID. Right? So while this seems tedious, these are all the possible ways in which events could flow through the system in a valid manner. Now, as you can see, this is, this is verbose to, for this demonstration to work. I start at line 41 and I go all the way through 151 with a few blank lines, so, so call it 100 lines-ish. Um, in this case, it's strictly necessary. It just so happens that phone calls don't happen in the order you always predict. Uh, even if the upstream system guaranteed me that I got events in the order in which, uh, which they happened, it doesn't guarantee the users will behave the way I expect them to. I could be in the middle of playing them back a recording, and I never get the webhook to tell me that the recording ended because the user hung up because it got impatient. Or maybe in the middle of it, they fat fingered something and their face smacked the side of the phone and they hit buttons. Well, now I'm receiving messages about buttons they've hit that I don't necessarily care about, but that the finite state machine has to be able to handle somehow. Um, so the whole, the whole goal here is that really what this comes down to is that this is some sort of quasi-sophisticated routing table. Those of you who've worked with Django or worked with Flask should see this as something a little bit familiar, right? I mean, in, in a routing table, one of those web frameworks, we give it some sort of regex, and it goes from top to bottom and figures out which one fits and then calls the appropriate controller. In this case, we're saying for some given source, we could transit to these other nodes, to these other states, if these conditions are met. And if they are, just like in a web framework where we defer control to some controller, we also have some notion of deferring control here. Um, for, every, for every state that exists in the system, there are a couple of implicit, uh, implicit methods that exist. So there are hooks for me to act when I enter a state. There are hooks for me to act when I exit a state. There are hooks for me to act when the machine is initiated or instantiated or when it's destroyed. So what I've opted to do is to use the hooks for when a user has transitioned into a new state. So let's say I receive a phone call. I tell Telnix I wish to answer it. They will send me back a webhook, uh, or I guess I should just take a step back. So they, they send me a webhook saying that they have, uh, they've received a phone call. Okay, great. I'm going to transition based on that routing table to the new user initiated state. So this, this function will get called as part of that on enter new user initiated. I'm sure you can guess if I wanted the opposite, I could say on exit new user initiated, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, I just defer to an answer function. And the answer function just turns around and calls our API and says, hey, tell next I'd like to answer that call. At some point, Hopefully, I get a webhook back saying, yeah, they've answered. At which point, what will end up happening is that routing table will end up calling on enter new user answered. At which point, I have an opportunity to, to act. In this case, I want to play, play some sort of sound, and this delegates to some thin wrapper of a request that sends a request to, uh, to Telnex's call control product. So as you can see, the, 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 num the, the actions themselves are not that complex, right? Uh, between 215 and and 260, uh, so less than 100 lines of code, I'm able to completely control, right, all the functions I need to control a phone call. It was actually more verbose for me to define what transitions were valid than it was to write the code to handle them. And that's really nice because if you spend your time doing a lot of if-else checking and a lot of exception checking, you quickly find that your code ends up handling more error cases and more edge cases than it does doing useful work, right? Um, I didn't have to worry about that. I set up that routing table. I trust that routing table will route calls appropriately. Once that routing table is set up, I can focus on writing what I want to happen during a transition. Um, at the bottom here, I have a couple of convenience methods. At some point, I want to store the last response I received from Telnix as part of my state, which I'll record my state machine. And I have a couple of, instead of writing a client so I can keep the code all in one place, I have a thin wrapper around requests to, to make a few calls to Telnex. Um, but for the most part, this is, this is it. This, the, the, the states of the transitions are where most of the um, paradigm shift lie for, for Pi transitions. Uh, 
If you can define your system as some collection of states and you have an idea of which ways it could go, you can define a routing table and once you've defined a routing table, you've already defined what functions you need to fill in. Right? If you transition into a given state, then you need to define a function for that state to happen, to define what happens there. And at least in Telnex, what I found when working with other carriers is that probably more than half of the cases I handle are for when those, those entities fail, right? Which is good, that makes me robust. I'm now forced to deal with the places that I never really thought possible that I kind of hoped that try catch at the very beginning of Maine came in handy, right? Um, so let's, let's show this system in action and then we'll talk about it a little bit because that was a lot of verbiage. So what I've done is I have this Django app running somewhere. Pull up the terminal. Ooh, that is really difficult to see. The words on the screen don't matter. What I want to show rather is that as I make a phone call, this server is taking requests and processing them. So the verbiage that appears doesn't matter. All that matters is that stuff's moving on the screen. So what I can do, since, since this is the point where in every talk where they break, I figured it would be really, really apt to make this uh, a call about, uh, about tech support. So I'm gonna call my tech support guy. Hopefully he picks up. Here he's a jerk. He didn't pick up. Should have picked up on the first ring. So I get for calling a US number. Have you tried turning it off enough? <laughs> Typical IT guy. So as you can see, we had a bunch of stuff move on the screen. So what happened? So each one of these pieces of white text represent a post coming into my system. So Telnex called me up to say, hey, something changed. And for some subset of these, not all of these, but some of these, I took action. Um, for instance, when it told me that the call picked up, I decided to play a sound. Uh, when it told me that the sound stopped playing, I hung up on the user because I don't feel like running up my phone bill. Uh, but in addition to being able to see stuff happening in the logger, I can actually go back to the database now and I can see what happened with this call. So if I go to presentation mode so that you all aren't squinting, I can select from that call control table and sort by ID and see exactly what happened and the order it happened. And I see some, some people that did not expect to call into the system called into the system. So I guess some of you already figured out what those stickers are for. <laughs> Cheaters. I just happen to know this is my phone number. So scrolling over, I can see that these are all attached to the same call session, which kind of makes sense. I only called once. I can see the beginning of this, I had zero calls, and after it ended, I incremented this counter. So now when I go back to look at the state machine, I know I've called before. Here are the events that I received. So if I wanted to, I could expand this and say, let me show an event. So Telnex will send me something, like they'll give me an ID and they'll give me some payload who it's to, in this case I'm calling an American number, who it's from, in this case I'm calling from an American number, the call is currently parked, it's incoming, this is when it started, and the thing we really care about is the event type. So if I go all the way over, event type call initiated. So when I say dot next, if I were to go back to my finite state machine, so, I, I happen to know that I've never called this system before because I wiped out the database five minutes before walking in. Um, so I happen to know that I started in the new user null state and that the only transition for new user null is new user initiated and that only happens if it's an incoming call event. So if somehow I sent events out of order and I told the system that I just hung up on it, the system would go, that doesn't make sense, I'm gonna ignore you. Uh, likewise, after that happened, I told Telnex I'd like to answer the call. That's what happens in the finite state machine. I send back a command, and they send me back a webhook telling me that, if I scroll all the way over, that the call was answered, right? We, we successfully answered the call. You now have a user on the line. At which point I submit back a command saying, could you play this MP3 of this really, really cheesy soundbite? And Telnex says, sure, we don't care. So on and so forth. 
So I'm able to go through for this given phone number and select these records, and I'm able to see every event that walked into my system and how I reacted to it. Uh, the reaction to it lies in the state label, this guy right here. So I can see I came in as new user initiated, or I, I say I ended at new user initiated. I became a new user answered, callback started, ended, hung up. If I had in the middle of the call started hitting buttons, I would have seen additional events roll into the system. But if it's in the middle of playing back a, a file and I start hitting buttons, I'll get notified that people were hitting a button, but I don't care to do anything about it. So I'll see additional transitions that just keep it in the same state, which is what I want. I don't want to react to a user hitting a button. If I did, that would be kind of weird since it wasn't intentional. Uh, but this finite state machine had a lot more than just dealing with new users. There is the notion of dealing with an annoying user. So what happens if I call back? This is a new call session, so the controller now, if it goes to look for a call session, won't find one. They'll say, ah, oh, this isn't the same call as dealing with earlier. But it will be able to look for my phone number and see that it's seen me before and remember that previous state. So if I call back. Hello, I. Yeah, have you tried setting it off again? A really shitty IT line. But I can go back to that database and see now that I now have new transitions. I can see that this phone number, which was me, rolled through. I went from new user hung up to annoying user initiated, annoying user answered, annoying user played back, started, ended, et cetera. And lastly, I happen to know there's one last transition. I've now bothered them a few times, and I'm pretty sure they're just going to hang up on me, or they're going to say something else rude. Who knows what their excuse is going to be? He was trying to say I'm disabled, but he's disabled. But if I come back here and refresh, I can see that I now have new events in the system. So you can kind of imagine uh, building an IVR around this, right? So if I used a finite state machine, I could say uh, one development team is responsible for dealing with incoming customers, one team is responsible for delegating customers to a given business unit, so on and so forth, and they can each work on separate parts of the finite state machine, or even combine these to, to have more advanced behavior. So the whole, the whole goal here is that, um, the whole goal here is that that, that demo took very little code. I, uh, I had to write a few booleans to, to test what type of event was coming in. They're all one-liners. And here I had to deal with uh, sending a few commands back to Telnex. But in return for defining this, at least in this case, rather ugly looking transitions table, I didn't have to worry about out of order events. The system just handles it. I didn't have to worry about unexpected events. The system just handled it. I didn't have to worry about trying to find edge cases. I've already defined them. I've already defined every single thing that the system could possibly do. So with that, uh, I'd like to open up for questions. Uh, we have a pile of bricks for the three most interesting questions. Uh, and before moving on to questions, some of you have received a sticker. On the back of that sticker was an Irish telephone number. That Irish telephone number points to the same system. So if you call three times, you get the same three recordings. And if you call a fourth time, it'll just recycle you through the system all over again. So if you want to go to the pub and show your friends something funny, or someone asks for your phone number and you want a good fake phone number to give them, I suggest using this. <laughs> so that was an awful lot of verbiage. I imagine there's probably a lot of code questions, so now would be a good time to open it up. Over here. Thank you. That was interesting. I found that a good way to structure the code for a finite state machine is to use object-oriented principles. If you define um, an abstract class for your, um, for your state, and then you define subclasses for each of the states, overriding next in each case, then you can take that code outside. You then instantiate the state, and you keep in one well-known place the current state. And each state has the opportunity to switch to a different one by putting a different object into that uh, global space. I think that gives you better modularity, enables you to uh, distribute work among teams, uh, and still take advantage of common, uh, common uh, situations, such as the uh, 
the um, events that you're not interested in handling. But uh, this is interesting. Thank you. There's a name for that pattern. It's uh, uh, strate strategy pattern. Strategy pattern. Mm -hmm. So being a former Java developer, of course, when we model these things, we love having a thousand files that do nothing and a thousand classes that contain one line because we're all about being verbose. Um, so prior to finding PyTransitions, I did use the strategy pattern, pattern quite a bit in, in Java. And the pain in the butt that I ran with there was that it was very difficult to test uh, that the transitions were set up correctly versus testing that the code that was supposed to be executed during the transition worked. In this case, I can, um, I can take those states and I can take those transitions and load them into a null state machine. So I could instantiate a state machine that knows about those transitions but doesn't call anything. And then I can ask a mock whether or not they were called. So I can separate th that routing table essentially from the behavior. And that for me was, was huge with this. Although you're absolutely right, the strategy pattern does work. Good. Oh man, he just stole that mic from you. That's kind of rude. <laughs> um, thank you. It was very interesting. I have a question about all the possibilities of the um, transition that you have defined. There is some way to to test with um, by transition all the possibilities and um, some test framework. I would say to 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 be sure that every every transition has be, has been tested or not. Um. There's no formal framework they give you, but it's fairly straightforward to test yourself. Um, as, as I mentioned before in the last answer, if you wanted to, you could take these transitions and these states and instantiate a finite state machine that has no state in it. And then you could ask it to transition to each possible state, and you know which states it should and should not transition to. You can then tell the finite state machine what, what state it's in and run through every state transition again. So in other words, if you want to exhaustively test every pair of states, you absolutely could with a little bit of metaprogramming. Uh, the pain in the butt there then is that what your test is really defined is the transitions table all over again, right? You, you now have, you know, your test has some adjacency list of uh, transition from and to, and you already have that listed here. So it gets a little bit weird. It's kind of like testing routes in, in Django. No one really does it, even though you could. Um, for us, a lot of what I spent time around was there's a package where you can ask, uh, you can ask PyTransitions to visualize this. So it'll use GraphViz to draw something. So we try to visually inspect that our transitions are fine. And then the rest of our time is spent dealing with what the transition actually does because in any sort of real production system, the uh, work being done the transition is usually far greater than trying to decide where to go. Um, do you know if there's a way of uh, plotting that uh, that uh, graph with all the possible states and everything to have that seen in a in a graphical way? There is. There are two tools for it. One is that um, here I've subclassed hierarchical state machine. Uh, you can add a subclass of graphical state machine, and that then gives the state machine a couple of methods to dump PNGs. Um, so you could ask it to dump the entire machine, which shows you every possible state and transition, as you can imagine, for the state machine would look quite ugly. Or you can say, given some state that I'm in, what are the possible transitions I can go to? Um, so there, there are ways built in for you to generate several different graphical views of your finite state machine. Uh, I opted not to in this demo because it's quite ugly and because our artist back at Telnice gave me something that was far simpler and prettier to look at, uh, but it's, it's a couple lines. It's, it's not a big deal. It's pretty straightforward. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my question is around uh, the events part and the conditions part. So yes. first question is like, uh, how do you supply events to the uh, uh, finite state machine like uh, I mean how I mean what should be the type of the event is it a specific type or how do you supply it and the second question is like uh, on conditions part is it possible to give a method and then the method returns the value of the condition or whenever I want to do a complex condition instead of just a single event I see uh, so for the first part when I instantiate my finite state machine you'll see what I'm really doing here, and this is where the magic happens. What I'm really doing is just saving off what's been passed into me, 
and then immediately deferring to PyTransition's machines constructor. So they want to know what state the machine is in. Um, and this is a little bit awkward because PyTransition's kind of imagine, they, when they built it, they kind of imagine that you're going to have a machine in memory and you're going to run through it to completion. But that's not what we do. In, in this example, because we're a web service, we start up, we instantiate a machine, we, we do exactly one transition and we throw the whole thing away, right? So I have to tell it, I have to remind it what state it was in. Uh, and for that, I look back to the, previous, um, to the previous state that I passed in and to answer that question, I pass that in the constructor. So in the view, once I figure out whether this is a, a currently running machine or whether I needed to start a new machine, at that point, either way, I have that state. Uh, I think I call it FSM state within the, within the view. And I simply pass that plus the event that I've received from Telnex into my constructor. Uh, so the event is a string. It's a basic small string. Uh, event is, it comes to me as a JSON object that I deserialize oh. into a dictionary. Uh, oh. it's, it's this thing. The events that come in is last event. So here I've serialized it to JSON, but it, it comes into me in, into this FSM in the form of a dictionary. You, you could pass in any arbitrary number of objects and any arbitrary types you wished. Um, if you wish to use their simple constructor that you can pass in the state as a single object, if you simply emit it, it assumes that it is the state, state equals self. So therefore, anything I, I pass into my constructor that I save in the object is now part of the state. So you could have six different models, two dictionaries, and a partridge and a pear tree for all it cares. You can pass in whatever you like. Okay, thanks. Well, you had a second question. On the conditions part. The conditions, yes. Okay, so, so here conditions is just a, a pointer to some function. But notice that this is passed in a list. Uh, I can pass in any number of conditions, and it, they, it treats it like an and statement. So all conditions must be true. So your options are either to write your conditions so that they're andable, or, that's a really confusing transition, or, that was even more confusing, or you can write a, a, you know, a more complex function that's less reusable. Okay, got it. In my case, it just so happened because I'm just testing for event type, I wrote a couple of functions I was able to reuse. Uh, but in return, I have all these kind of silly looking one-liners. Not as sophisticated as I'd like, but doable. Got it. Thanks, that answers both my questions, thank you. Thank you. Um, hey, uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned that a lot of the systems that we work with uh, usually can be thought of as state machines. And so I'm wondering when is it useful to like define it explicitly and when is it um, like just more overhead than it brings up the benefit? So how, how do you decide that? Mm. So as I kick the podium. Uh, so there were two things that went into it for us at Telnex. One was complexity. Uh, once I get more than, say, a couple of states, or once I get some confusing transitions, it becomes very difficult to manage as a collection of ifs. So if the number of states and their relationships is relatively complex, I like to go to this. Uh, the second reason I went to this is because our workers are distributed. Um, when you buy a phone number, it's not just one machine processing it. The machine that actually purchases the phone number may not be the machine that, uh, that tests it out. So by breaking it up this way, every action can be then serialized and sent on to some other worker. Even if I have a machine die in the middle of the day, the customer won't notice. Some other machine will just pick it up. So there's a resiliency factor in there too. Uh, the last thing was that um, we we really wanted to be able to see what had happened to that phone number, right? So we wanted to have some sort of event sourcing. Uh, and, and this seemed like a natural way to structure it. I can go back to this phone number and, and see every bit of state it had been through and why it went through that state, right? Because I stored both the event and what the finance state machine calculated. So I can, you know, go back and debug very easily. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. It's Hi. a nice way to actually have the transitions represented in one place. But what I dislike is, um, is there any better representation of those things, uh, function calls, some objectizing? I agree that they're ugly. And that's probably my least favorite thing about Pi transitions. In the background, when you pass in the transitions argument to the machine constructor, 
these get broken down into trigger objects. Um, so you could, instead of just defining a list of dictionaries like this, you could define a list of trigger objects. Uh, so it's supported. Excuse me? It's supported by the... I don't ladder. know. I don't know if the, if the trigger object requires, uh, requires a function name or if you can pass it a function pointer. I, obviously, for, for type checking reasons, I would, I would much rather be able to pass in a function name as something other than a string. Uh, when writing this demo, there was more than once where I fat finger something in my routing table uh, and I told it to call a, you know, a condition that didn't exist. But it didn't catch it till runtime, which is really crappy. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to catch that in a unit test or no reason I shouldn't be able to catch that in instantiation time. I had all the information up front. Uh, so the short answer is I don't know. But if, if it were to exist, it would exist by using that lower level construct. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Going once, going twice, sold. Thank you everyone for sitting through that wall of text and for coming out.